views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. Welcome to Knowledge Book Radio with Marge Potasik. Marge was searching for the purpose of her life and the truth that would tie everything together to make sense of what was taught and what was happening on our planet, the fire that was creating all the smoke. Through many experiences, she was finally led to the knowledge book that provided all the answers. Marge is now talking about this gift to humanity on Knowledge Book Radio, so all can be united in peace, love, and harmony. This live call-in show at 1-800-930-2819 is amazing. So get ready to hear about the Knowledge Book. Here's your host, Marge Potasek. I'm Marge Batazic, and you are listening to the Knowledge Book Radio with Marge Batazic on Transformation Talk Radio. As we've been doing for the past year and a half or more, we are now talking about additional topics in conjunction with the Knowledge Book. And this week, we are going to be talking about memory. But before we go and talk about memory, I'd like to remind you that the United States website for the Knowledge Book is www.usa.theknowledgebook.net. Again, www.usa.theknowledgebook, all one word, .net. The Turkish World Brotherhood Union website is www.dkbdavidkiteboy-mevlana.org.tr. Again, www.dkb-mevlana.org.tr. And this is where you can find the um, reading schedule for the reading program, which starts every year on February 19th. Now, my contact information as far as getting questions to me or suggestions uh, for topics to cover on this radio show. My telephone number is 973-787-7035. Again, 973-787-7035. And my email address is mmjp99 at gmail.com. That's marymarijohnpeter99 at gmail.com. So please do email or text me or call me with any kind of questions that arise from today's topics or from previous shows. And of course, any topics and suggestions or questions for future shows are very, very welcome. Okay, so now we can cover some of the information um, that we're going to talk about today. And that is... We're going to cover... um, today. So this was my cell phone that answered. But anyway, when we're talking about memory, there is a song that actually I remembered. And the title of the song is I Remember It Well. It comes from the movie or the play Gigi. And it was presented by Maurice Chevalier and Hermione Gingold. Basically, there are two people older at this point, and they're remembering back to where they were young. And of course, each one of them has its own, has their own particular version of the same memory. So the song kind of goes like, we met at nine. No, we met at eight. I was on time. No, you were late. And then it's, oh yes, I remember it well. We dined with friends. We dined alone. A tenor sang. A baritone. Yes, I remember it well. There was a dazzling April moon. There was none that night. The month was June. And it wasn't April. That's right. And it also goes on to say how often I've thought of that Friday, got corrected again, Monday night, when we had our last rendezvous. And somehow I foolishly wondered if you might be remembering this too. 
the, that carriage ride. You walked me home. You lost a glove. It was a comb. Ah, uh, yes, I remember it well. Brilliant sky. We had some rain. Those Russian songs, actually, they're from sunny Spain. So anyway, it goes on and on. But the basic premise is each one of those individuals remembering the same event had a completely different and at times opposing ideas of what what happened and what happened that time ago. So all of our memories have their own little spin on them. All of our memories are basically could be different from everyone else that went through that same experience in the same room or in the same location. So each one of us has our own particular view, our own particular memories, and our own way of remembering things. So let's go maybe dig a little bit deeper as to what memories are, how they form, how they are kept, and how we remember. So um, in terms of memory, some say that it is the key to our identity. Other people say that actually our memory is, makes up who and what we are. And still others state that without memory, we are basically nothing. You remove our memories, we become nothing. We don't know who we are, where we came from, how we came to be in terms of personal development. But how does memory actually work? What happens in the brain to create a memory? And then how is that memory kept? And how is that memory then recalled? And what happens when, as and this must have happened to all of us at some point in time or other, when we see a particular color or when we smell a particular food or an aroma, when we hear a particular song or see of a poem or see a particular view and all of a sudden we're right back and we have this vivid memory that was implanted and printed in our brains a long time ago. So how do we remember some things and not remember others? How are we able to take in, imprint, store, and recall memories from last year, the year before, 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 60 years ago, or from yesterday? So today we're going to be talking about memory and discovering a little bit more about this topic. Now, memory, of course, is a mystery, and it's also becoming a mystery to us as we're going along because we sometimes are confused why we can't remember something we did yesterday when we can remember something in a very, very great detail from 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And scientists have been exploring and are still exploring of the mechanics of how our brain creates, stores, and retrieves memory. Now, some of the research that has been done has led to some very surprising discoveries. And actually, some of those discoveries led to conclusion that memory is not accurate or static. It is not static. It changes as it goes along. And scientists also have found that Memories can be manipulated. Not only can they be manipulated, they can be changed, and they and other memories can be imprinted. In other words, they can imprint false memories. So if you repeat something long enough, and according to some of the studies that have been done, you're able to believe that something actually happened when none of that actually happened. That memory was implanted in your brain. So... What is the mechanism behind being able to remember? So questions like we always, at least, will find maybe some of us are very familiar with these questions. Where are my keys? There was a time when the last five minutes of me leaving the house for any kind of an appointment, I was looking for my keys. Five minutes or my glasses. Or some of you may identify with, well, I bought presents for my grandchildren, for my children, for my parents, for my grandparents. I bought presents. Where are they? Where did I put them? And what is the answer to this quiz? We may remember the page. We may, we may remember the book. We may remember the page. We may remember the paragraph that that answer is on. But somehow our almost photographic memory does not allow us to actually see the actual answer to the quiz question that was just presented to us in class.
And of course, where did I put my glasses? I don't know if this has happened to any one of you, but you're looking for your glasses when your glasses are actually on your nose and you're wearing them as you're looking for them. And of course, when people start getting together and reminiscing about what they did last year or New Year's or Christmases or some holidays sometime past, people will have varied experiences and varied memories about the same event that they attended all together. And more and more recently, it turns out that I know I was very, very busy the day before, but somehow I cannot give you a list of what was accomplished the day before. So let's dig a little bit deeper. Di uh, deeper. So how does a first kiss, the first sight of our baby, or a graduation, or a party dress become an indelible memory in a split second? When you think about it, all the occasions that we remember, everything that is happening, is on a very, very small time frame. We're talking split seconds here. And somehow that gets put into our brain. So, and then how can we still see the picture that we have in our mind? How is it that we're able to see this many years afterwards? And this has been and still is one of the biggest mysteries in science. And although scientists may say that they understand the mechanism However, we're only at the tip of the iceberg of actually fully understanding memory. We have some clues, but we still don't know what the entire process is, how it works, and how um, it all is put together. So we still don't know what the complete mechanics of memory are, and they don't know, they cannot delineate the entire process of how it happens. Now, there are some individuals, and they're called eight SAMs, H-S-A-M, Highly Superior Autobiographical Memory. And now there are some individuals, there is a scientist who's been doing research on this and actually he discovered these individuals. His name is Jim McGaw. And he is a pioneer in the science of memory. He discovered H-S-A-M about 20 years ago. And again, after uh, testing about over thousands of individuals, he found 55 of them. And basically, these individuals are those individuals who basically cannot forget. If you give them a specific date, whenever that, whatever date that is, whether a year ago, two years ago, 20 years ago, you give them a specific date, and they will be able to give you accurate information about that date, and they're accurate to, from about 80 to 100% per sec. 100% correct. And they've done studies on these individuals, and they're finding that there is a particular area of the brain called the eucinate fasciculus that is more active in those individuals who cannot forget. Um, now, the eucinate fasciculus is basically a white matter tract in the human brain that connects parts of the limbic system. And the limbic system has got to do with the hippocampus and amygdala in the temporal lobe, and it connects with the frontal ones, such as the orbital frontal cortex. Basically, it's a white matter in a particular area of the brain that connects one part of the brain to another part of the brain. Now, the function of this particular section of the brain, part of the brain, is as yet unknown. However, it is found that in several psychiatric conditions, it is affected, and it is also very active in those individuals who cannot forget, these HSAMs. When this part of the brain, because it's damaged, when this part of the brain is removed, with that surgically removed, removing the eucinate fasciculus, it was found that any individual who has this part removed, they are not able to name famous faces. In other words, we could see a picture of Elvis Presley, we could see a picture of Einstein, but those individuals will not be able to identify them as Elvis Presley or as, as Albert Einstein. So it turns out that they suspect that this eucinate fasciculus has got to do with a part of the circuitry that's involved in the retrieval of word form for proper names. 
However, when you remove this, it's got nothing to do with affecting conceptual knowledge or learning knowledge, which is interesting. Now, there is one particular HSAM. His name is Jake Hausler. He's pretty famous. He's the boy genius who I think went to college at 11. Um, he's the youngest HSAM found, Jake Hausler. And they've been studying and mapping his brain and comparing it to the brains of other children to see how his brain works differently than all the other brains. So he literally cannot forget any detail of his life. He is able to recall with precision what was going on, what they ate, who was wearing what at home or whether they were anywhere and is able to recall everything, all the events in his life. Now, one of the questions that I have, and I think others have as well, is this. Do these eight SAMs, these, these individuals who cannot forget, do they have more stuff that they store in their brain, or are they then able to retrieve it better than we do? In other words, we may have the same capacity to be able to store the memories. However, we may, may not have the same kind of capacity to be able to retrieve the memories. So that's another question that needed to be answered. And again, some further questions and server research, further research on memory is this. So we have memories and no one doubts the fact that memories do exist. However, the definition of memory is itself pretty nebulous. So Dictionary.com defines memory as that mental capacity or faculty of retaining and reviving facts, events, impressions, etc., or of recalling or recognizing previous experiences. Another definition is a faculty as possessed by a particular individual, such as to have a good memory. And the third definition is the act or fact of retaining and recalling impressions facts, etc., remembrance, recollection from memory. So prior to 1950, even though some clues were available, we did not really understand or know much about memory at all. However, there was a single patient that actually changed all of this around. The gentleman's name was Henry Molesen, and based on what happened to him <clears throat> and the research done on him afterwards, gave lots of clues as to what memory is, where it is stored, and how it is retrieved. So his he, Henry Molison, developed very severe epileptic seizures after he had an accident on his bicycle. Now, because these seizures were so severe and so impairing to his life that neurosurgeons decided to map the area where the brain of the Mary, the area of the brain where they thought the seizures actually started. So based on the studies that they made of the brain signals fire brain, they were able to locate the area where the seizures started. And what they did was actually remove that area. And it turns out that there was the hippocampus area of the brain that they removed, and they removed most of it. So they were successful. The surgery, the removal of the hippocampus, did eliminate the seizures. He no longer had seizures. However, there was a very alarming side effect. HM, as he was known, is was no longer able to form new memories. He could not learn anything afterwards. He could not remember anything that was happening to him. And that's how scientists were able to discover that the hippocampus was actually responsible for creating long-term memories. Now, <clears throat> they knew that he could not form new memories, meaning he did not know what he did the day before. Any task that was given to him was given, basically, he thought it was as something actually new that was happening. Now, there was a person called Brenda Milner who wanted to know whether he could still have some form of memory despite the fact that he could not form long-term memories. So she devised a puzzle for him. Now, the puzzle was he was supposed to trace a star figure. However, he was not allowed to look at the paper that he was drawing on or tracing on. He was supposed to be looking at it in a mirror. So his hand was blocked from his view. 
However, he saw his hand and the, the figure in the mirror. Now, if anybody has tried drawing anything by looking at a mirror as opposed to their own hand, it, it is difficult. So, however, after a few trials, normal people who were able to learn, you know, regular learning and regular memory were able to do it after a few trials. However, Henry had no long-term memory and therefore he would not have been able to learn any new tasks, or at least that was the theory. And every time Milner was asked, actually every time Milner asked him to trace the star, he stated that this was the first time that he's doing it, but he's going to try. And the surprising thing is that eventually, after many, many times of trying to do this, he was able to eventually trace the star. So again, this was another breakthrough. breakthrough. Despite not being able to remember the events of his life, he still had the capacity, he still had the ability to learn motor skills. Okay. So since Henry could learn motor skills, that meant basically that memory isn't just one thing and doesn't only form in one location and only with one, with one mechanism. And there was another gentleman, Dan Schachter, who actually did research. And through his work, it was found that there are many different kinds of memory and they depend on different parts of the brain. But... Even though we may know where memories reside in the brain, but knowing and understanding the underlying mechanism that puts them there, ready to be recalled, is actually quite something else again. So, so there was a study that was being done by a gentleman. His name is Eric Kandel. He's a Nobel Prize winner, and he's been studying memory for 60 years. And he wanted to know on the cellular level, on the basic structure of the human brain, on a cell, cell level of how memories form, form and then how are they saved in the brain and what mechanism actually puts them there. So what he wanted to do, his idea was to find the cellular level changes that occurred in the hippocampus as a memory was created and stored. So what he was expecting was that the cells and the changes that they were undergoing would be unique and therefore could be recognized as they were taking place. Meaning if we had a cell with a particular configuration and if a memory was put there or something, something had to change in that cell that we could recognize that a memory was stored and actually something happened to that cell that we could measure and that we could say that yes, this, met, this cell underwent change. He was, in fact, able to actually hear the sounds of the cells of the hippocampus firing as a memory was being stored, as a memory was being, as something was being learned. So um, Eric Kandel decided, actually, once he heard that things were happening on the cell level, meaning just sound with the firing, then he decided to use a very simple animal to test his theory out. And what he needed was a very simple animal with a very simple nervous system and with very simple behavior patterns. And he picked the Aplesia californica, which is this giant sea slug. And this has one of the simplest nervous systems in the animal kingdom. So what he wanted to do is to document whatever cell changes happened as the slug learned a simple task. And he thought that this would be the key that will be able to unlock how a human memory works. Now, of course, a human is a much more complex organism, both at the DNA and, and at the neuronal level. However, even though the human is more complex, there is not much difference in the human and the sea slug in how the neurons fundamentally work, as they fundamentally became behave in the same way. So we see... Just like in the neuroverse system, we see duplication in the systems of nature all the time. So in other words, we have an eye. Whales have eyes. Fish have eyes. Dogs have eyes. Cats have eyes. Most seeing creatures have eyes. So it's the same functionality in all of them. So if you study one that is a simple one, maybe you get a clue as to how everything works. So first of all, before he could do anything, he needed to create a memory in the slea slug. So this is what he did. 
he trained a sea slug to fear a slight touch. Now the sea slug has a siphon where he takes in water and spouts water out. And when that siphon is touched, the siphon is automatically withdrawn. And the gills also are slightly withdrawn. This is something maybe akin to what we ha happens to us when we put accidentally our hand on a burning pot or on a flame and all of a sudden our hand just instinctively just withdraws, it jumps back away from danger. So this is what the sea siphon, what the siphon on the sea slug actually was doing. So what he did was he paired this touch to the siphon with an electric shock, an unpleasant sensation. And this caused a much stronger reaction in the slug, okay? So eventually, through this classic, um, the classic conditioning, he repeatedly followed this procedure until the sea slug reacted strongly to just a slight touch without the electric shock. So he produced with a slight touch the same reaction as, he re as the slug made to the electric shock, meaning a strong reaction to a slight touch. And even weeks later, the slug was able to be able to remember this because it had learned it and was able to then react strongly to a light touch. So therefore, he understood that a long-lasting memory had been formed, but the mechanism at that point was still unknown. So what he did, Candell did, was extract two neurons from the sea slug a sensory neuron from its siphon and a motor neuron from its tail. And these were connected by a single synapse. Now, if you remember, a synapse is a point of contact where one neuron communicates with another. They don't exactly touch, but they're very, very close. There's chemical signals that go in between. Now, just like in a live animal, he repeatedly stimulated the sensory neuron. And when he did that, something amazing happened new synaptic connections started to grow. And for the first time, they realized that long-term memory involves an anatomical physical change in the brain whereby new connections are being formed. So memories are basic connections between neurons. That's our memory. The connection between neurons is the physical form the memory takes. And of course, modern technology allows us now to observe on a cellular level. So when a neuron is stimulated, the nucleus of the cell starts to pump out tiny proteins. They're called mRNAs, messenger RNAs. And these are little recipes for building proteins. And these mRNAs are actually travel along the axon to the synapse with instructions to build new connections. And when it arrives at the synapse, the instructions are released and new connections start to grow. And this is how a memory is being formed, how it gets imprinted in our brain all in a split second. All in a split second. It's amazing when you think about it. So the anatomical, anatomical changes that occur in our brain when we learn or remember something are the same in slugs and in humans and are considered the biological basis of memory. So this is something that we've been able to arrive as a conclusion. So this is what science now believes are the fundamental processes to learning and memory in all of us. And this was done and paved by Candell's work. It's the growth of new connections that allows a memory to remain for months, days, and years. However, it is only a piece of the entire picture. Even in a sea slug, a memory is made up of about 50 neurons out of 20,000 that maybe are in a sea slug. In a human, we, that, that would mean about tens of thousands of, out of 100 billion neurons. It is this network that stores memory. And this is how the world dimension memory and learning is created and fixed in the brain. However, based on what the knowledge that is being given in the knowledge book, a person's evolution level dictates what knowledge is permanently imprinted at dimensions higher than the world frequency. Now, the light photon cyclone technique of the knowledge book draws down and fixes the time consciousness and energies onto the letters and provides the attainment of dimension, energies, and frequencies at that person's evolution level. 
It is the person's evolution level, how close we are to the actual essence and far away from ego that actually signifies that person's frequencies. And it's only when the frequency of the brain cells are at the same level as the letter is being read, does the person remember and understand what was being what was read. Now the connections in the brain become permanent. The connections are locked in place and the person remembers the knowledge gained. It is never to be forgotten again. So once you're at the evolution level of the knowledge that you are reading, those frequencies in your brain are at the same level of the frequencies in the knowledge book that is being read. And therefore, those frequencies, that knowledge locks with the brain cells and you cannot forget. If you forget, that means you're still not at the evolution level that allows you to remember that particular knowledge in that particular frequency in the knowledge book. And the other part of the light photon cyclone technique also, it also blocks any energies and frequencies higher than the, than the person's consciousness level. And the brain is then protected from any shock. The person gradually increases their energies and frequencies and knowledge. So gradually over time, as we're reading the knowledge book over and over again, either according to the um, reading program or on our own, as how we see fit, as we evolve, as we go closer and closer to essence, to our essence, to our true selves, and as we go away from ego and we go away from the world dimension to higher and higher energy dimensions and frequency dimensions, we are then able to remember more and more and understand more and more. Okay. So the next question, of course, was, okay, we have a basic understanding and knowledge as to... Um, as to how the, the process of memory is formed. However, where are they actually going? Where are they stored? Where are they held in the brain? So even though we have some idea of how memory is done, how memory is implemented, how memory is imprinted, but however, we do have no idea as to location of a particular memory, as to where that memory lives. And that is still rather more of an unknown than a known. However, they did make some progress in this area. So there are new brain imaging tools, and they are being used by neuro in neurological research, and they're charting the memory in the human brain. So science has now a rough map, an approximate map, of where some of our memories live. And as it turns out, it is not stored like a book on a particular shelf in the library or like a particular letter in an envelope. It's not in any one particular area of the brain because different parts of memories are coded in different parts of the brain. So when we're remembering something, we're not taking a book off the shelf, opening it, reading that memory, and putting the book back, closing the book and putting it back on the shelf. Or if that knowledge is or memory is like an, a piece of paper in an envelope or a letter in the envelope, we're not opening up that envelope, taking out that letter, reading whatever's in that letter as a memory, putting it back in the envelope and putting it back on your desk. It turns out that the visual elements are stored at the back of the brain in the visual cortex. The smell components are stored in the olfactory cortex just above the nose. The motor or kinesthetic elements, movement, touch, are stored in the motor cortex at the top of the brain. Any emotional elements of that memory are coded in the deep brain structures like the amygdala. It is the hippocampus that grabs these individual brain anatomical areas, bundles these bundles of information, and binds them all together. So, in summary, the memory is initially split into its functional parts, sight, touch, smell, whatever component it is, it is put into its own particular part of the brain that corresponds with that function. And then these locations are connected through the wiring in the hippocampus to form a complete memory ready to be remembered. So it's not one entire thing that is held in one location that you take out. It is many things in many locations that are interconnected, that are wired together by the hippocampus and by these neural, neuronal networks. So again, different because since different parts of the memory live in different parts of the brain, 
and connections are important for storing them, that means that every memory is imprinted into the brain. So there is a wiring, there is a connective wiring, so that if we remember birthdays, a particular birthday, maybe sweet 16 birthday, or maybe our graduation, that graduation memory that we have is basically a bundle of synaptic connections. It's a bundle of wires that connects different parts of that memory together. What our cap and gown look like, what our parents look like, what the um, graduation venue was, everything, whatever uh, sights, sounds, smells that we were able to hear or see for that particular memory. But even though memories are imprinted, memories are also changeable and dynamic. Now, if you want to see how dependable memories are, not only the, the clip that I had about this, uh, um, these two individuals who remember the same event with completely different details, and of course we really don't know which one of those individuals was really correct, whether one part was the correct part or the other part was the correct part, or maybe each one of them has, was correct in some of the time but not correct all the time. So um, even though they're imprinted, at the same time they're dynamic. They're, they're, you're able to change the memories for some reason. Somehow what we remember, what we recall is not the same. So we've been up to this time covering what happens when a memory is actually stored. But we haven't touched at all as to what happens when we actually bring it back, when we actually remember. And this becomes even more interesting as the process goes along. So is the, math, the memory is actually static or fluid? Is it imprinted, never to be changed? Or can it be changed? And what happens to the connections that were made between all the separate areas of the brain that make a memory? What happens to those connections when a memory is recalled? Now previously, as I just mentioned, the understanding was that a memory was like a book. It was a complete thing. It lives in a particular place. And if you want to remember it, you take that book off the shelf, you read it, you look at it, and then you put it back unchanged. Um, you know, the print may fade over time, but the memory is still there. There was a gentleman, Karen Nader, who went to one of the lectures that was given by Eric Kandel. This is the guy that was studying memory for 60 years with the sea slug. And he described how memory, uh, he was, just, you know, Eric Kandel was describing his research into memory, and Karen Nader had a question. Okay, fine. What if what happens when a memory is created also happens when it is recalled? What if the same process both produces and recalls a memory? So this was an interesting question because nobody expected that the process would be the same. So Nader designed an experiment again to test this his hypothesis. So what he did was he trained rats to fear the sound of a tone so every time that tone was given, he also applied a shock, a mild shock. And of course, the, the, the mouse or the rat was afraid, so they would freeze, so they could actually see when the rat remembered what was going on. So when that sound was heard and shock was produced, the rat would stop moving because it would be frozen in fear. Now, rats created long-term memory were the ones that when they heard the tone, they would freeze without receiving a shock. They just would freeze at the sound of the tone. And, I, and Nader, at the beginning of the experiment, again played the tone to make sure that the rat's memory was still there and it froze at as it was expected to freeze. And then what he did was inject into the mouse brain now, of course, the brain does not feel any pain with, with a medicine called anisomycin. And this is a compound that blocks the formation of proteins that are needed to be able to build connections and to store new memories. So basically, he was stopping the production of new connections or production of connections between neurons. And... 
his hypothesis was that since the rats had already formed the memory, the injection of this medication, this compound, this anisomycin, should not have any effect whatsoever on the rats, meaning the rats should be able to remember and be able to freeze at the sound of the tone. However, what actually happened after the injection, the rat did not react at all to the tone and kept moving happily about the cage. It's as if the rat had never learned the tone, shock, freeze correlation. So what he proved was that both the creation and recollection of memory uses the same pathway, the same mechanism, and therefore, despite the fact that that memory exists, it is possible to change the memory by the act of recalling it. So memory is vulnerable to alteration, and this was an absolute shock. Okay, maybe this is now time for a break. And you've been listening to Knowledge Book Radio with March Bachazic. And to remind everyone that our website is www.usa.thenowledgebook.net. My telephone number for questions and topics is 973-787-7035. Email address mmjp99 at gmail.com. Mary Mary John Peter at gmail.com. Stay tuned. We'll come back and we'll finish this topic of what we've been covering. to the Astral Insider, your portal for adventure, insight, and growth with Fernando Albert. And get ready to tour the astral realm, expand your life in ways you've never imagined, and call in for the journey of your life with this world-renowned lucid dreamer, astral projectionist, psychic medium, and healer, Fernando Albert. This is every second and fourth Monday at 9 a.m. Pacific on TransformationTalkRadio.com. A word of caution, if you prefer the status quo and you are not interested in improving every aspect of your life, this book will trigger the shift out of you. The Truth is Funny, Shift Happens is available now. Author Colette Steffen brings the powerful knowledge and life-changing energy and empowerment from the radio airwaves to the pages of her new book. To get your copy in paperback or ebook, visit thetruthisfunny.com today. Jane Matanga with Grow Your Soul Radio. It's been said that whatever you believe, you are. When you take charge with your positive thoughts and beliefs, you are the creator of your perceptions. You have the power to shift your reality. When you begin to shift your beliefs, the universe will dream a bigger dream for you than you ever imagined. Believe in your dreams, and every part of your world can open up in new and glorious ways, because everything is possible. I'd love for you to join me on Grow Your Soul Radio with my co-host, Dr. Pat, on Transformation Talk Radio. It's time to get your life back on Burn Bright Today with Jennifer Marcinelli. Tune in each month on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Learn to move from the darkness of burning out to the light of burning bright. Jennifer is redefining stress and the energetic causes of burnout, shining a light on process to get your life back. For more information about Jennifer and her work, visit BurnBrightToday.com. Are you ready to finally feel empowered and knowledgeable in your political stance? Let Marsha Padilla Goad educate you on exactly how important grassroots advocacy is in a relatable way to all perspectives. Tune in to Grassroots Advocacy Radio with Marsha every first Tuesday of the month at 12 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Visit DynamicsInPublicAffairs.com. on the Knowledge Book Radio with March Batasic on Transformation Talk Radio. 
www.usa.theknowledgebook.net, 973-787-7035, and mmjp99 at gmail.com, Mary Mary John Peter at gmail.com. Again, these are for information about the knowledge book. This is for t additional topics or questions about the topic we covered, had previously topic covered, or would like to cover in a future show. Okay, so now we'll continue with memory. So the, what we left off, we basically got to, to the conclusion through Nader's work that memories are fluid and that recalling a memory uses the same mechanism as making a memory. And as you're recalling a memory, this has the effect of disrupting the memory. And this was a very significant discovery and advancement in understanding memory. And therefore it changed everything that science has just had thought about memory. Every time a memory is recalled, the memory needs to be resaved reconnected by creating new proteins to essentially rewire the memory into the brain. And this, of course, led to thousands of experiments resulting in both confirmation and expansion of the understanding. Neuroscientists have found that memories could be altered or even removed. This means, and this kind of work paved the way to treat severe phobias, PTSD, PTSD post-traumatic stress disorder, and drug addiction. So there is hope now for those individuals who, are in, who have these conditions, who are undergoing these conditions, that their memories could be ameliorated, they could be changed through the work that is being done by science. Now, are memories reliable? So if this mechanism that puts the memory in place and is the same mechanism that needs to be done correctly when a memory is recalled, that means every time we recall a memory, we can change it somewhat. And therefore, that's why when we remember a particular event and more than one person was at that event, whether that was the shooting in Dallas, you know, when Kennedy was shot, or the assassination of Martin Luther King, or any event, happy or sad or somewhere in between, when any event is recalled and more than one person is at that event, their memories would be different, can be different. Now, Elizabeth Loftus has been studying how unreliable memory is for over 40 years. And memory errors are all around us. And instead of saying, do we asking whether we do or do not have false memories, the question actually should be, how false are our memories? So research has actually shown that false memories of something that never happened can be implanted with the subject really believing that the event happened. More and more is being discovered every day. Science still has a long journey before we can fully understand memory and learning. Now, recently, it was also found that magnetic fields can affect memory. So not only our recollection process and our being not able to exactly put the memory back the way it was before, unlike these eight SAMs who can remember everything exactly from 20 years ago or 30 years ago, exactly what they did, how they did, what it looked like, what the taste was, they can recall exactly. So they have the ability to put back the memory exactly as it appeared, as it existed prior to their remembering it. So the basic premise is that the memory is connected to a certain magnetic field. Though, so a memory can be recalled only when the magnetic field is the same as when it was created. So when I go to Turkey, I'm in a different magnetic field. I mean, we're in Turkey, we're directly in the Alpha Channel, where everywhere else on this planet we're getting reflections of the Alpha Channel through the Knowledge Book. If I want to make sure that I remember everything that was said and I want to recall what was said and how it was said, I need to put down my notes in Turkey. Because once I leave Turkey, I cannot remember everything that I that I tried to remember when I was there. It was amazing how this particular piece of knowledge from science actually correlated with my actual experience, okay? So magnetic fields, you need to be in that magnetic field in order to retain the information from that magnetic field. And according to the knowledge book, 
Magnetic fields are strong energy knots created by thoughts. The higher the energy, the stronger the magnetic field, and the stronger the magnetic field, the greater the attraction power. Magnetic fields created by thoughts will attract like thoughts formed and will bring people on the same wavelength together. Similar thoughts or similar magnetic fields attract each other. This is how groups are formed, how organizations are formed, and committees are formed, and countries are formed. The Knowledge Book, by giving cosmic energy, strengthens our magnetic fields and therefore our frequencies, and we are able to link with higher and higher dimension knowledge and gain never to be forgotten as the connections become permanent. And our being able to recall that memory does not change that memory in any way, meaning our brain is able to handle that memory, store that memory, and recall that memory without changing it at all. It is not being affected by our usual third, you know, third dimension world processing. And all the learning, all the knowledge is stored in our brain archives for each of our lives. Now, science is asking, did evolution get it wrong? Why would evolution leave us open to implanting false memories and encoding incomplete or false facts? How many times have we seen a TV show or movie where the witnesses were eliminated because they did not remember what actually happened? However, science is also proposing that a malleable memory allows humans to change, to grow, to learn new behavior, and therefore to have the ability to arrive at new conclusions and new discoveries. We consider our memories to be our identities, who we are. However, the knowledge book states that our identities are our past experience incarnations. At every moment, all our thoughts, all our actions, and all our experiences are registered in our archives. Each life's archives becomes our treasure chest of learning and knowledge. Eventually, we reach an evolution level that allows us to use the key in our physical brain to open those past treasure chests to reunite ourselves into a coherent whole, a genuine human. And through the brain gymnastics of the knowledge book, our thought goes from the speed of light at zero frequency, third or world dimension, to multiple times the speed of light and eventually leading to many thousands of times the speed of light. Just as our brain has different parts of a memory in different places and then connects them to form a complete memory, the knowledge book has the same word in different contexts throughout itself. But here our thoughts and the level of their frequencies, evolution level, have the function of connecting them to a cohesive whole, a complete dimension that thereby opens that dimension, that knowledge and energy to us. Each human is in a different reality, at a different evolution level, each progressing at their own rate. As we individually reunite and individually become a whole, a genuine superhuman, all of us, by means of the accelerated evolution plan through cosmic influences and the path designed in the knowledge book are unifying into a greater totality as superhuman, superhuman totality and unified reality. So basically this session, this program was devoted to memory, how the memory is stored, how it all works, how it all functions, and how it correlates to the knowledge book. So basically, to recap, our memories are basically stored in different parts. The memory itself, the partitions or portions of each memory is stored at different locations in the brain. And then what makes them the memory, a totality, a whole memory is the connections between those locations. So the part memory of everything is stored together and everything is held in our brains. And our brains are amazing, amazing computers, amazing computers, biological computers. So we've only got a little bit of time left. And I would like to remind everyone that we still are able to send you the three chapters from the knowledge book as samples for you to see whether... Uh, this is something we would like to pursue or not. Please contact me um, with any kind of questions you may have or about the knowledge book or the topics we've been covering. And we'll be covering more topics on a weekly basis. Um, so please do contact me, either telephone, text, or email. Um, or the, uh, the knowledge book focal point location has changed, so please contact me for the new location of the focal point. We have not been able to change the website yet, but it will be changed shortly. 
So humanity's verdict is in humanity's hands, as Mrs. Chirac often tells us. And the knowledge book also states that you are the ones who will save the world. Until next time, take care. been listening to Knowledge Book Radio with Marge Potasek. Marge was led to the Knowledge Book, a gift to humanity and its time of transition to the golden age that provided the truth and energies and frequencies. Now she shares information from and answers questions about the Knowledge Book with you each Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern on TransformationTalkRadio.com. For more information, visit Marge at USA.TheKnowledgeBook.net Are you ready to stop stress, anxiety, and low self-esteem from running your life? Join award-winning author Dr. Friedemann Schaub for Empowerment Radio and learn breakthrough solutions to switch out of survival mode and approach every day with great ease, joy, and purpose. Tune in the first and third Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific to Empowerment Radio with host Dr. Friedemann Schaub on Transformation Talk Radio. Visit the fear and anxiety solution.com to learn more. How often do you find yourself wondering, why me? Learn a new shift in perspective to see how everything that takes place in your life is actually working for you and shifting you towards your own enlightenment. Tune in to Blank Enlightenment Radio with Misty Thompson each month on TransformationTalkRadio.com. For more, visit MistyMThompson.com. That's MistyMThompson.com. <laughs>